Welcome, everybody, to our Wednesday by Kirsten Bosch, Straight Nature, and Room to to introduce our speaker. But before we get on to that, just a little bit about our sponsors, Straight Nature. Straight Nature is the leading specialist natural history publisher in Southern Africa and associated with the best-selling and most highly regarded field guides in the region. Straight Nature publishes full-color illustrated uh, books across a variety of subjects, including birds, mammals, reptiles, trees and flowers, as well as the uh, marine environment, geology, astronomy, general wildlife, and children's nature. And then Room to Grow. We're an exterior design and project management company that's been designing and creating outdoor living spaces in and around Cape Town since 2002. We offer a complete suite of landscape design, construction, and ext uh, associated exterior design elements to our residential and commercial and retail clients. And you can find out more on roomtogrow.co.za or follow us on our socials, Instagram and Facebook. And then it is my pleasure today to introduce Ian Engelbrecht. Ian is a leading expert in Southern Africa scorpions and Magalagorf spiders and has traveled extensively to study these remarkable creatures. He has an MSc in conservation biology from the University of the Witwatersrand and a PhD in zoology from the University of Pretoria. He has discovered many new species and has one species named after him and I think we're all looking forward to bringing the scorpions out of the dark. So over to you Ian. All right. Um, thanks very much, Brett. And um, thanks to Strake Nature and Room to Grow and Sandby for this opportunity to talk to you all today about scorpions, which are one of my favorite groups of animals. Uh, certainly not everybody's favorite animals, but um, something that I've been working on um, quite intensely for, for most of my life, actually. So, um, what I'm going to start off with is uh, just referring to the title of the talk, Sc Bringing Scorpions Out of the Dark. And that's just a bit of a play on the fact that scorpions are nocturnal. They're active at night. Um, the reason for that is that they need to avoid being eaten by various kinds of predators that are active during the day. So they're trying to avoid things like birds and baboons and, and other kinds of predators. And, um, and that's the reason for them coming out at night. But one of the coolest thing about scorpions is that um, they actually glow under ultraviolet light in the dark. So this is a photograph of a big rock scorpion here on the screen, um, glowing this sort of bluish green color, which um, is a, a, a result of this fluorescence that they have in their cuticle uh, when you shine a UV light on them. So the reason for this is actually um, not very well understood. Uh, there are many uh, uh, sort of theories as to why scorpions glow in uh, under UV light, um, but uh, we, we actually understand the mechanism by which they glow. So we know what the compounds are in their cuticle, which makes them glow under UV light, but we don't have a very good understanding of why. Um, like I say, there are several different theories. The one is that there is enough UV light bouncing around under natural conditions at night um, you know, bouncing off the moon, uh, sort of coming off the moon and other light sources at night that make scorpions glow very dimly and that their eyes are tuned into seeing that particular color at night and it enables them to see each other. Um, so, so that's one theory. Um, another theory is that it has something to do with um, the way that they perceive light on their skin. So similar to the way that if you go out into the sun and the sun shines on, the, on your skin, you can actually feel it. Um, and uh, so, so some scientists have proposed that this glo these glowing compounds in the scorpion's cuticle enable them to perceive light when it, um, when it, when it, when it shines on them, uh, which is obviously, you know, the, that's linked to them being nocturnal and wanting to get out of um, being in bright light. Um, and, uh, and there are some other theories as well as to why they glow. Um, the problem with these theories is that scorpions that occur in caves, uh, so deep underground in caves, which never come into any contact with light. Um, so uh, so these, are, these are cave specialists. We have several 
cave specialist scorpions in different parts of the world. They've completely lost their eyes. They've lost all pigment in their cuticle as well. And they glow under ultraviolet light just as brightly as any other scorpion. So, um, so the theory is a little bit um, uh, uh, difficult to, to prove if that's the case with, you know, so, so if scorpions that live in caves and are never exposed to light are glowing, um, it's probably not serving some kind of uh, functional purpose um, for other scorpions um, either. So it's, so my thinking about it is that it's probably got something to do with the way that the scorpion's cuticle hardens when, it shed, when, when they shed their skin. So when a, when a scorpion sheds its skin, it comes out of the old skin and, um, and the new skin doesn't glow under ultraviolet light. And it takes several hours for the new scorpion skin to kind of harden up and, um, and get nice and tough like, like it normally is. And during that process, it develops the um, ability to glow. And so I think that this ability to glow is actually the compounds involved have actually got something to do with the hardening of the cuticle, um, some kind of chemical process there rather than actually um, uh, serving some other kind of process, uh, some other kind of purpose. But it makes scorpions nice to uh, study. So when you're, if you're um, looking for scorpions, you can go out with UV light at night and you see these little scorpions grow, glowing green um, in the bushes and on the ground. Um, it makes scorpions easy to find at night and obviously has quite significant um, you know, uh, implications for the way that we're able to do research on scorpions. And I'm gonna come back to scorpions glowing under UV light a little bit later in the presentation. So let's start off just by talking about what scorpions actually are. So scorpions are arachnids. They belong to the same group of animals as um, spiders and solifuges, uh, things like ticks and mites and harvestmen and all of these other groups. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, we've got a little family tree that was taken out of this publication here. Um, the, this was um, based on a, on a comprehensive genetic study that was done in uh, 2016. And it basically shows the relationships between these different groups of or organisms. So here, the Opiliones are the, are the harvestmen. It's these guys over here. They look kind of like daddy long legs. Um, they look kind of like little armored daddy long legs. They've got these very, very thick cuticles. And, um, and those guys look like they are most closely related to the Acariformes, which are the ticks and the mites. Um, and that whole group is then in turn related to the more sort of advanced uh, arachnids, if we, call, if we can call them that. So here we have the scorpions. So this group over here is the scorpions, which seem to be related to all of the other arachnids, the spiders, the whip scorpions, and the whip spiders. So um, scorpion relationships have been under debate for some time. Um, people haven't really been sure where they fit in with the other arachnids. Um, there's been some, uh, some people have suggested that they might not actually be arachnids at all, and that they're actually a separate group on their own. Um, but the co current evidence kind of suggests that they are arachnids related to the other arachnids that breathe with book lungs. So the important thing um, about being an arachnid is that you have four pairs of legs. So that's one of the, the key things um, with scorpions. They've got four pairs of legs, eight legs in total. And then they have these distinctive pincers on the front of the, um, on the, front of the body as well. So, so I like to um, sort of uh, point out the similarity between um, a scorpion's pincers and our arms and um, the fact that scorpions use their pincers for many of the same things that we use our arms and hands for. Um, the structure of the pincer has got a sort of an upper arm part, a forearm part, and then it's got the hand with the fingers. And scorpions are using their pincers for all kinds of things, mostly for grabbing onto and holding onto prey items, um, but they use them while they're mating, while they're burrowing, um, they use them for detecting prey, um, all, sorts of, all sorts of other things as well. Also being arachnids, scorpions' bodies are actually divided into two main parts. It looks like three parts, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the first is the cephalothorax, or what I very informally call the head over here. So this kind of anterior portion of the body, um, which is covered by the carapace on the dorsal side. And that's got all the appendages attached, attached to it. <coughs> oh, excuse me. 
So the legs attached to the cephalothorax and the pincers attached to the cephalothorax. Um, it has the scorpion's brain and, and sort of the anterior parts of the, um, of the digestive system as well. Um, it's covered on the top here on the dorsal surface by a, the carapace. So the carapace is a single hard plate and in the middle of the carapace are the two median eyes. So scorpions have got these two large eyes here on the top of the carapace, but they've also got a set of small eyes on the, uh, well, two sets of small eyes on the anterior corners of the carapace as well. And the number of eyes there can vary. Um, so some, some species have two and some species have up to four, typically three. So most scorpions have got eight eyes in total and, um, and some have got uh, six or even 10 eyes uh, in total. The next important part of the body is the abdomen, right? So, so this is the, the sort of central portion of the body here. And, um, and attached to the abdomen is the scorpion's tail with its five tail segments and the talzin being the last part of the tail. Now, um, I said arachnids have got two body parts and um, the tail is actually a modified portion of the scorpion's abdomen. So um, the tail segments are actually abdominal segments and they contain part of the digestive system as well, um, as, as well as operating the sting and the venom glands and everything else. Um, so, so yeah, so, so the tail being part, a, a modified portion of the, of the abdomen. Now the business end of the scorpion is, is down here, the, the, the sting and the venom, uh, the aculeus, the, so the venom vesicle and the aculeus. Um, the venom vesicle holds the, the scorpion's venom glands and um, it obviously uses the, the sting to, um, to deliver that venom into a potential prey item or, um, or predator. Okay, so just getting into a little bit of, of scorpion biology, what do scorpions eat? Um, this photo shows those median eyes quite nicely. You can just make out these little lateral eyes on the front corner of the carapace there. Um, but despite having all of these eyes, scorpions don't see very well. So they're not able to form very high resolution images. The little uh, lateral eyes are basically just there as little light sensors picking up um, whether, whether, the, whether it's light or dark, the scorpion uses these for setting its sort of um, daily rhythms. So to know, okay, it's, it's nighttime now, I should come out and start being active or it's daytime and I should um, uh, uh, hide away. Um, the median eyes do are, the median eyes are able to form uh, some level of imagery, but it's very low level, uh, very low resolution imagery. And we think that they use them mostly for navigation at night. So when the scorpion comes out of its retreat and it goes walking around, um, it's able to form a map of its surroundings by the areas that are lighter and darker and, um, and is actually able to navigate back to its retreat again afterwards. Some people have even um, suggested that scorpions are able to navigate by, by starlight. So they're able to form a map um, of where they're going by, by, by um, looking at the stars above them and use that to navigate, um, which is obviously quite, uh, 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 quite interesting. So scorpions are predators. They feed on, uh, on insects primarily. This is a big uh, thick tail scorpion here that's caught an adult uh, antlion and is busy feeding on that. Um, but they'll feed on basically anything that they can catch and kill. So um, their diet is made up mostly of insects, but they will eat other arachnids. Um, they'll take prey items up to their own body size or even larger than their own body size. And, um, and, uh, and like I say, anything that they can capture and, uh, and, and kill and feed on. Um, this is just some examples of, um, of things that scorpions eat. So on the left-hand side here, we've got a big burrowing scorpion that's feeding on a millipede. And that's interesting because not a lot of things are able to eat millipedes. Millipedes have got little poison glands along their, the sides of their bodies, which release a, a cyanide um, based toxin, but burrowing scorpions and rock scorpions and other thin-tailed scorpions are actually able to feed on millipedes and they're able to process those toxins without any ill effect for the scorpion. And it's quite interesting to see how they do this. They'll catch the millipede and um, they crush it to death with their pincers 
and then they eat the millipede one ring at a time. So, so millipedes are made up of all of these uh, segments, each of which has um, sort of got this uh, hard um, ring of cuticle around it. And the scorpion eats each one of those one at a time. And while it eats it, um, the scorpion's saliva actually bleaches that millipede ring. And um, you can often pick out the retreats of these burrowing scorpions and rock scorpions because they have these little scattered white millipede rings um, at the entrance of the burrow or at the entrance of the treat of the retreat. Um, quite distinctive for these guys. On the right hand side here, we've got a little um, thick tail scorpion which has caught uh, termite alates, uh, flying termites. And um, you can see this guy's a little bit greedy. He's got one in his mouth and uh, one in each pincer as well, um, waiting to eat those um, uh, as soon as it's done with this one. And, um, and so scorpions are very opportunistic. When you have these sort of mass emergences of flying termites, or if they come across a nest of harvester termites or, or something like that, they will literally eat as much as they possibly can. They grab as many as they can. Um, and I've seen scorpions walking around at night with, with all of these termites, with a whole bunch of termites sticking out of their mouth and a whole bunch in their pincers as well, um, uh, ready to eat those as soon as they, as soon as they can. And uh, scorpions have got a really interesting reproductive cycle as well. So um, this is a photo of a pair of scorpions doing their mating dance here. So these are little lesser thick tail scorpions. And uh, the female is on the left hand side, the male's on the right hand side, they're sitting on a little branch and, um, and uh, engaged in the middle of this mating dance. Now, um, scorpions are actually cannibalistic, so they will eat members of their own species. So you can imagine that that means when it comes to mating, you need to be quite careful. And uh, the male scorpions go through quite a ritual to actually um, placate females and get them ready to mate. Um, when a male's ready to mate, he goes out at night, he goes searching for females. And um, while he's walking around, he'll do, he'll do something called juddering. So he'll, he'll walk along and every now and then he stops and he stands up high on his legs and he vibrates back and forth. And he's basically sending out vibrations to any nearby females to let them know that he's around and that he's, um, and that he's willing to mate. If the female is receptive, she will do the same thing. So she also stands up and vibrates back and forth. And then the male knows, ah, okay, there's a receptive female over there um, and he can approach her safely to, to mate. If she's not receptive though, she'll often just sit still and wait to see if he'll come close enough that she can actually just grab him and eat him. So it's not easy being a male scorpion. Um, the, females, the females don't do a lot of the work. They kind of stay in their retreats while the males go out at night searching for them. Um, they get eaten by other female scorpions, but they also get eaten by a range of predators that are out at night uh, looking for them. So owls and, and, and things like that. And so if you go looking for scorpions at the beginning of the breeding season and you go UV lighting at night, you see male scorpions all over the place. There are lots of male scorpions around. But at the end of the breeding season, there are almost none left. And that's because they've been eaten by all of these, um, all of these other things. So when a male finds a receptive female, the first thing he does is he goes up to her and he actually grabs hold of her pincers with his own pincers like this. And they start this mating dance. So he he leads the dance. He basically um, pulls her back and forth. And, um, and what they're doing here is that he's trying to find a nice smooth surface where he's able to lay down his, um, lay down a little package of um, sperm called a spermatophore. So, um, so he leads her back and forth, but sometimes the female might still be a little bit resistant, in which case he pulls her up close like, he, like he's done here, and he massages her mouth parts with his own mouth parts. Um, this is a behavior which has been termed kissing. So scorpions can be quite romantic when they're not busy eating each other. And um, this behavior of kissing has been proposed as a way that the male tries to uh, calm the female down a little bit as well and, mate, and, and get her to be more, um, more willing to, to mate. Um, some scorpions are less romantic and the male will actually sting the female um, during this mating dance. So he'll be pulling her back and forth if, she, if she's resisting a little bit, he actually turns around and he brings his tail around and he stings her 
in her soft membranes on the side of her body. Um, we're really not sure what's going on there. So um, we don't know whether the male is um, actually injecting venom into the female or whether this is just kind of like a, a jab in her side um, just to kind of give her a little bit of a, a prompt, you know, to, to get going with what they're, with what they're doing. Um, but, but scorpions are immune to their own venom. So, um, so even if he is injecting female, a venom into the female, um, it's, it might have some kind of calming effect on her, um, but, but it's not going to have any adverse effect on her because, um, because of this immunity that they've got. So, um, so they do this little mating dance, back and forth they go, the male um, sort of pulling the female along, trying to find a suitable spot for them to actually mate. And when he finds a suitable spot, he starts laying down this structure called a spermatophore. So you have to look at this photo quite carefully to see it. So it's the same two scorpions and the, and, um, the male extrudes the spermatophore from uh, an opening on his underside, the little genital opening. And this is the structure over here. So it's um, under the female, it looks, it looks like a little piece of dry grass, actually. It's a long tubular structure. Um, it, it's attached to the branch over here on this end. And um, you can see sort of this little strand of, um, of mucus or, or liquid um, still attached to where, where the male has actually extruded it. So, um, so he's extruded it. And now what he's doing is he's actually trying to pull the female over that structure and get her to um, take it up in her own gentle opening. And it's amazing to watch scorpions do this because they can't actually, like I said, they can't see very well. So they're not seeing what they're doing, but the male knows exactly where that spermatophore is. And he knows exactly where the female's genital opening is. And he kind of like pulls her backwards and maneuvers her back and forth very, very carefully, um, pulling her over that spermatophore and then kind of releasing her, um, hoping that she'll pick it up as he releases her. And eventually this thing connects with her genital opening on, on the underside. And, it, and the moment that happens, they both freeze. They both freeze absolutely still. I don't know how they're communicating with each other while they're doing this. I don't know how the, how the male knows when the females picked up that spermatophore, um, but they know. Um, so she picks it up um, and they freeze. Um, as soon as she picks up that spermatophore, she starts absorbing the sperm into her genital opening, which takes a couple of minutes. And um, as soon as she's done, she then goes for that male. And uh, you've never seen anything run as fast as a male scorpion that's just mated. He bolts off in the opposite direction um, because if he doesn't, then he's likely to become, to become dinner. So something else that's fascinating about scorpions is that they actually give birth to live young. There are very few arthropods that do this. Um, in, in some scorpions, it's, it's true ovovivipary, so, so that's basically where the, the females are just retaining the eggs, the eggs develop internally, and uh, when they're about to hatch, the scorpion uh, gives birth to, to these babies. But in other scorpions, uh, specifically in the thin-tailed scorpions, they actually don't have, um, there's no egg. Um, in the process, and they basically have a structure that's um, similar to a mammalian uterus, um, or, or they've got several of these structures in their internal reproductive system. And the baby scorpions develop in these, um, in, in these uh, uh, uterus-like structures, and they receive all of the nutrition directly from, um, directly from the mother. So it's quite an advanced uh, reproductive system, and, um, and the females are giving birth to live young. The number of babies can vary quite dramatically. So um, some species of scorpions have um, you know, very few babies. They might only have three or four babies. Um, the average is typically sort of um, between say 15 and 25 babies at a time. Um, but for some species, some of the larger thick tail scorpions, um, they can have 60 or 70 babies, and I've even heard cases of thick-tailed scorpions having more than 100 babies at a time. 
Once the babies are born, they all climb up onto the mom's back like this. So, so, so they, they climb up onto her back and, and they all sit in this tight cluster on her back. Um, they're completely helpless in this early stage of development when they're born. They're basically, they're unable to feed. They're unable to fend for themselves. They don't have any of the structures that they need to go out and, and find retreats or, or anything like that. And so they're basically climbing up onto mom's back like this for, um, for protection. And they'll stay on her back for about two weeks or so and, um, and basically finish these sort of final stages of development. Um, when they're born, they basically, I, I sort of, I think they look a little bit like fly maggots with legs and tails. Um, so they're this very, very pale color. You can just make out all the various body segments. You can see their eyes. You can see their eyes quite nicely. Um, but their skin is very, very thin as well. So, um, so they're quite prone to dehydration and the mother actually keep, uh, helps keep them moist during this period. But, um, but like I say, they're, they're unable to feed and, um, and they're unable to drink at this stage. And they're, they're, li they're basically living off stored body fat um, for these two weeks while they're on uh, mom's back. And then after those two weeks, they will shed their skins for the first time. So you have to look at this picture quite carefully, um, but this is a batch of scorpions, baby scorpions on mom's back with several of them actually busy shedding their skins. So this little baby scorpion over here is shedding. You can see that because all of the legs and the pincers are pulled back, still caught in the old skin. So it's kind of pulling itself out of the old skin. This one over here is pulling itself out of the old skin. This one up over here has just got out of the old skin as well. There's, a, there's an old skin here, and um, you can just make out the little bits of the skins that, that the, um, as, as these little baby scorpions are shedding. So, um, so they stay on mom's back for that early stage, and then, um, then they all shed their skins pretty much simultaneously. It's like someone says to them, right, guys, it's time to go. Um, everybody shed their skins. After they've shed their skins, they come out looking like little miniature replicas of the mother. So um, they get all of the structures that they need to be able to feed. You can see this little guy's mouth parts over here. The mouth parts look like um, two tiny little pincers. Um, they get all of their sensory structures, their little sensory hairs and everything that they need to be able to detect prey. Um, but they're obviously still quite, um, uh, 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 quite delicate and, um, and quite fragile after they shed their skin. So they'll, they'll stick around with mom for a little bit longer, um, maybe another week or so, just while the new cuticle hardens up and, um, they, they, and they're able to become fully independent. And after a week, off they go, they disperse and go and, um, and make lives for themselves. So um, this is just a photo of a, a scorpion that's recently shed its skin. So, so, late, so, so in this very early stage, um, when, when the scorpions are still in this nymphal stage and they shed their skins, the skins don't look like very much. But after that, um, the skins look like you can see that that was a scorpion. It's the full cuticle of that scorpion. And they obviously need to shed their skins to grow. Um, this is true of all arthropods, so insects and spiders and scorpions and everything else. Um, they all have to shed their skins to grow. And, um, and it'll take a scorpion between six months to several years to actually reach adulthood. So um, it depends on the kind of scorpion it is. It depends on how much food they get. And, um, and they'll shed their skins periodically as they grow to, to reach adulthood. Um, they typically shed their skins between five and six times between, um, between uh, uh, when they leave the mother and reaching adulthood. And, um, and they're actually, they actually increase dramatically in size each time they, time they shed their skin. It almost, it almost looks like they double in size every time they, they, um, they shed their skin. So it takes between, like I say, between six months and several years to reach adulthood. And, um, and then it, the, the lifespan of the scorpion depends on the, on the type of scorpion as well. Um, but most scorpions live for several years and um, at least let's say two years, but there are some scorpions that have been recorded living 10 or maybe even 15 years um, after they, they reach adulthood. So they do really live for a, long, for, for a very long time um, for an arthropod. 
Okay, so getting into the more serious stuff about scorpions, the, the first thing that anybody wants to know when they see a scorpion is, can this thing hurt me? Is this a dangerous scorpion species? And um, what you need to look at when you're trying to work out whether a scorpion is dangerous or not is the size of the tail in relation to the size of the pincers, right? So the rule of thumb is that if a scorpion has got thin pincers, small thin pincers, and a really big thick tail, then you're looking at a scorpion that is potentially dangerous. The size of the scorpion is also really important. So, so small scorpions, even though they have um, venom that is just as potent as the venom of the adult scorpions, um, they don't have very much of it. And the quantity of venom that a scorpion injects when it stings some, somebody is, um, is an important deciding factor in how serious that sting is gonna be. So in South Africa, we've got two species of scorpions that cause serious scorpion stings. Um, and we, we do have a small number of people that die from scorpion stings every year. Um, it's unfortunate because um, scorpion stings are avoidable if you take uh, particular precautions. So if you make sure that you're wearing good shoes when you're walking around at night, um, if you're um, not sleeping on the ground in areas where you get dangerous scorpions, um, you know, shaking, if, you, if you're out on a camping trip or hiking or something like that, you make sure that you shake out your boots before you put them on. Um, and, you know, doing things like that, it, uh, you know, are, are important ways of avoiding getting stung by scorpions. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like common sense, you know, like wear good shoes if you're walking around at night in areas where you get dangerous scorpions. Um, but people, you know, people don't do it, especially on hot nights when scorpions, you know, which is when scorpions like to be out and active. Um, and there was actually a story of um, a guide in the Kruger Park who was leading one of these hiking trails that they um, that they do in the Kruger, these walk, you know, these walk walking trails that they do in Kruger. And, um, and he had a whole lot of guests with him. And he said to them, guys, it's a nice warm evening. The scorpions are probably going to be out tonight. Um, make sure that you put your shoes on. And he didn't put his shoes on. And he got stung by a big um, Transvaal thick tail uh, later that evening when he stepped on it. So always a good idea to be wearing good protective shoes um, uh, in areas where you get dangerous scorpions. Um, so if you do get stung by one of these dangerous scorpions, um, it needs to be, so, so we're talking here about one of these really large thick tail scorpions, um, big thick tail with a, you know, in a very big scorpion, um, it needs to be treated as, an, as a medical emergency. And the person should be transported to hospital as quickly as possible. Uh, you can apply a crepe bandage to the affected limb just to slow down the spread of the venom a little bit before you transport them. And um, so, so you're not, you, it's, it's basically putting a bandage on about as tightly as you would for a sprained ankle. Uh, you're not trying to stop the, the flow of blood. You're not trying to cut off blood flow to that limb. Um, it's not a tourniquet. Um, it's, it's just a pressure bandage that is intended to, um, to slow the spread of venom and uh, give you more time before you have um, the onset of, of serious uh, symptoms. Um, so these scorpions are neurotoxic. The, the venom is neurotoxic. It's affecting the nervous system and, um, and, and the stings are very, very painful. So um, unlike um, bites or, or, well, bites from other neurotoxic animals, like um, if you get bitten by a mamba or a, or a Cape Cobra or a um, black button spider, which are all neurotoxic animals, um, the effects of the venom in those animals is not particularly painful. So um, it's obviously very serious, but um, you don't suffer from the same extreme pain that we see in, um, in scorpion stings. And it's got to do with the mechanisms uh, that scorpion venom uses to interact with the nerve cells and, um, and, and, and hypersensitizing those nerve cells as opposed to deadening them, uh, which we have um, in those other neurotoxic animals. So, so the symptoms that people experience is, is this extreme uh, pain at the, at the site of the sting um, and then spreading pain and numbness from uh, from that sting as the venom spreads um, through the body. And um, 
So, so you, you get one of the one of the key symptoms is, is that you get this hypersensitivity in your um, in your skin after a scorpion sting. And it literally feels like if you touch your skin, you, 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 it feels like you're being shocked with electricity. You feel these, the, what it feels like electric shocks um, passing through your skin and up into, um, up into the rest of the limb. Um, a friend of mine was, he, he runs overland expeditions and um, he had one of his clients stung by a really large thick tail scorpion um, up in Angola a couple of years ago. And um, it, 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 was a, it was a big guy. It was, it, the, the, the guy was really large. He wasn't wearing shoes at night. Um, and he stepped out of one of the vehicles and stood on and, um, and crushed one of these thick tail scorpions. And so the scorpion obviously stung him and delivered as much venom as it possibly could. And um, uh, that was at about eight o'clock in the evening. Um, the guy was almost completely paralyzed the next morning. They had to medivac him out of Angola into, uh, into Namibia to get anti-venom treatment. Um, but what he said was that his entire, it, it was just an absolutely agonizing experience. His, everything was hypersensitized. Even having his fingers touch each other like, like this was agonizingly painful and blinking was painful because he would, his eyelids were touching each other and causing this, um, this, the, these kind of electric shock uh, sensations. So really not a pleasant experience to have um, if you get stung by one of these large thick tail scorpions. Thankfully, um, you can treat them with anti-venom and, um, and there is uh, you know, anti-venom available or, or hopefully there is um, at the major hospitals. And, um, and, and so these, these stings can be treated. Um, Obviously, as is always the case with antivenom, you only want the person to be treated in hospital by a medical professional. It's not a good idea to be carrying antivenom with you if you're going into the field um, and, and in case you might need to administer it for a snake bite or a scorpion sting, um, you, you, you really want to make sure that it's a doctor doing this with the necessary um, precautions on hand. And the reason for that is because administering antivenom can induce anaphylactic shock and, um, and you don't want to have somebody go into anaphylactic shock in the bush and you're not, um, you're not prepared for that. This is a thin tail scorpion on the other hand, and you can see just how small the tail is in one of, uh, in, in this particular species of scorpion. Um, this is a rock scorpion. Stings from rock scorpions are almost inconsequential. Um, if you get stung, it itches for a little bit and you don't have anything else, um, anything more serious than that. But if you get stung by a lesser thick tail scorpion or by a burrowing scorpion or something like that, then treatment basically just comes down to pain management. Um, the stings can be very painful, but the pain is localized. You don't have any serious um, systemic effects at all. And um, you can either apply ice or, a, um, or an anesthetic cream or something like that um, to the site of the sting just to, just to help with that, um, with that pain. Okay, so let's get into um, scorpion diversity in Southern Africa and what this new book is actually all about. So we have four families of scorpions here in Southern Africa. We actually have um, a, a, very, a very diverse range of species of scorpions in Southern Africa, one of the highest in the world. Um, a lot of people think we've only got two families, the thick tail scorpions and the thin tail scorpions. And some of the older books and guides and manuals and things like that um, just talk about uh, the two scorpion families, the thick tail scorpions, which are the beauty day, and the thin tail, the thin tailed scorpions, with, uh, uh, which are the scorpioni day. Um, but that changed um, a long time ago. I think it was almost 30 years ago that that changed. And the, the thin-tailed scorpions were actually split up into multiple different families. Um, we've now got the Bothra Uri Day, uh, which don't occur in South Africa. They're only up in northern Namibia and southern Angola. It's this little like relictual, uh, a Gondwanan relict group of scorpions. There are there are lots of Bothriurids in South America. They're the, they're the dominant non buthid scorpions in South America. Um, but they almost went extinct in Africa after the split of South America from Africa. 
and um, and we just have these three sort of very enigmatic species that occur in um, uh, in northern Namibia and Angola. We then got the Buthidae, which are the thick tail scorpions. Um, so those are the big um, Parabuthus, the really large thick tails, but there are a whole lot of other um, Butha genera as well. Um, and then on, on the, thin, the, the, the other thin tail scorpion family that we've got here are the rock scorpions and, um, and creeping scorpions, which belong to the, to the Hormuridae. Now, the kinds of things that you need to look at um, when you're identifying scorpions can be quite detailed, right? So if you're identifying burrowing scorpions, for example, you need to look at things like the, the texturing on the underside of the abdomen and the first few tail segments. So these are two different species of burrowing scorpions, and this one's got smooth sternites and tail segments, whereas this one's got this sort of um, texturing on the ternites, on the sternites and tail segments. Something else that's important for burrowing scorpions are the features of on the carapace. So the position of the main of the eyes on the carapace, whether they're in the middle or set back um, from the middle, um, and also the presence or absence of this V-shaped structure on the carapace is really important. If there's anybody in the audience today who wants to become a, a scorpion identification expert, um, looking for this V on burrowing scorpions is your first port of call um, when you're trying to recognize what, uh, what, species you're, what, what species you're looking at. Um, with rock scorpions, so this is a rock scorpion on the left here, the first thing that we look at when we're identifying rock scorpions is the shape of the first tail segment, whether it's broad and flat or narrow and um, compressed from the sides. Um, with little, with the lesser thick tail scorpions, um, the, the coloration and patterning is really important. So whether it's got a dark stripe down the middle of the abdomen or a light stripe down the middle of the abdomen, those are really important features. Also important with these guys is the color of the different pincer segments. So has it, in this case, we've got dark hands followed by the paler, paler forearm and upper arm, um, as opposed to other species which might have the entire pincer being pale uh, um, by comparison. So, um, so these are the things that, you, th these are the kinds of things you need to look at when you identify scorpions. And, um, you know, they, they, they do seem quite detailed. So, so when I tell people about this, I'm like, these are the features. You need to look for a little V-shaped structure on the front of the carapace of the scorpion. Some people will go, oh my gosh, but that's, that's too much detail. That's, you know, how is anybody supposed to, um, remember something like that. And um, I just want to point out that um, it's not only scorpions where you have to remember all of these what seem like um, infinitely minute details to be able to identify things. So anyone who's got into birding will know that you need to look at um, that, that birds have their specific sets of features that you need to look at. What color is the bull? What color is the legs? Is the bull got a little, has the bull got a little hook on the front or does it not? Um, so it's exactly the same thing. Every group of animals has their particular features that you need to, um, that you need to look at to be able to identify them. And, um, and if you want to become an expert, you need to spend time learning what those features are. And that's where the new book comes in. So we've never had a book that provides clear identification guidelines for all of the scorpions in, um, in South Africa. And, um, and that is the niche that this new book is intended to fill. It covers all of the species of scorpions in the country. And, um, and it's, as far as I know, the first of its kind in the world, the first comprehensive identification guide to the scorpions of a particular country. If you open up the book, the first page has got this quick guide. It's basically like a little spread that shows you the diversity of all the scorpions in uh, South Africa. And this is your starting point. If you've got a scorpion in hand and wanting to know what it is, this is where you start. What group does it look like it fits into? And it's, uh, uh, this quick guide indicates the pages in the book that you need to go to in order to start um, identifying it down to species level. 
It's got some introductory matter after that. So just some basic biology about scorpions and also some information that's useful if you want to go out looking for scorpions. So where should you go looking? How should you go looking for them? And, um, and so on. It's got this little how to use the book section, which explains everything um, that we see in the species accounts. I'll tell you a bit more about that as well. And then for each family and for each genus, it's got a little introductory section as well. So it tells you a little bit about the genus, and then it breaks the genus up into species groups. So it basically says like, okay, we've got, so this here, we're talking about the thick tail scorpions. And in the thick tail scorpions, we've got the Brevimanus group, and it shows an example of a Brevimanus group species. The yellow species group within the thick tails, and it's an example of one of the yellow thick tail species. Plus all of the, well, we have, the members of the group, as well as the important features for actually identifying um, uh, uh, members within that group. So it gives you a nice introduction into the kind of stuff that you need to be looking at um, when it comes to identifying these things. And this is an example of a species page in the group. So we have most of the information on the left-hand side of the page, and then the photos on the right-hand side of the page. And uh, with the photos for all of the species, we have these gray card images of the female of the species as well as the male of the species. So these are standard images taken on a uniform gray background so that you can compare all of the species with each other and really see how they differ um, from one another. We also have natural background photos so that you can, you can get a sense of what the scorpion looks like in life in the field. Um, as well as habitat photos of where you might actually be able to find these scorpions. The info page on the left, uh, well, the, the text page on the left has this little info panel down the side. Um, we obviously have the species scientific name up at the top, and, um, and we have the pron pronunciation of the species name. So this is Parabuthus planicorda. Um, scientific names are really important for scorpions. We usually refer to them by their scientific names. Um, just because we, we, we don't really have common names for all of the scorpion species and they haven't really, um, where we do have them, they haven't really caught on. Um, and so we have the pronunciation of the species name just to make it a little bit easier for people to use these spe species names. Um, we also have the, um, the meaning of the species name just to give it some context of what this name actually means. We have little distribution maps um, these are obviously quite coarse scale distribution maps, but they give a sense of where the species occur um, in the country. Um, and then we've got this little sort of venomosity scale. I, I, I've nicknamed it the hot chili scale. And it's basically an indication of how potently venomous the scorpion species is and, um, and how dangerous it is to, um, to, to humans. And obviously, um, be red being the more seriously dangerous things, orange being things that will give you a really nasty sting, um, but nothing more serious than that. And then the green things are the one are the species that have relatively mild stings. And if you page through the book, you can see that most of the scorpion species that we have in South Africa um, are down here on the mild end. And the stings are painful, but not really um, all that serious at all, um, and, and not something to worry about. Uh, we've got these nice little size indicators as well, which kind of give you a sense of, um, of how big the scorpion is. And then the text includes the important identification features, behavior, distribution, habitat, and so on. Um, one of the things that I really like about it is that it's got the similar species section. So when you're doing your identifications, you can actually compare this species to others that are similar and see exactly what you need to look at uh, uh, to tell them apart. And then for some species, we've got little taxonomic notes, some interesting stuff about the taxonomic history um, of the species as well. So putting this book together has been quite an adventure. And I can say that it's almost as bad as doing a PhD. It's taken me um, more than 10 years to do it. Um, with extensive traveling, huge amounts of field work, um, a huge amount of effort going into this. Um, one of the key things when I started out um, on this uh, uh, project was that I wanted to get these standardized gray card images of all the species, specifically to enable people 
um, to, to identify them and compare the different species. So I think it's one of the really nice sort of um, aspects of this book is having these standardized images. And this is the setup that I used um, to do that. So it's actually a, a, a mixing bowl that's got the bottom cut out of it. And I've painted the inside of it uh, white with um, reflective road paint. Um, I place, I turn that bowl upside down and I place it on top of three camera flashes. So I have camera, camera flashes inside the bowl facing upwards so that um, when I take the photo, I've got a little remote trigger on the camera. When I take the photo, all the flashes go off at once and they provide that nice uniform lighting um, across the, um, across the, the, whole, the whole image. Um, I'm sure you can imagine, so um, the, the book has 108 species included. Uh, for many of the species, it's got multiple color varieties. I had to get a lot of scorpions to sit and behave nicely on a little gray card background. It really took, um, it, it, was, it was quite something doing that, lots of fun, especially with these big thick tail scorpions, um, which don't like to sit still. They don't like to sit with their tails behind them like this. Um, you, you really have to coax them nicely to do that. And it took me a long time to figure out how to do this. And so I eventually found out, um, I, I got these little sort of soft paint brushes and I found that um, you have to kind of get the scorpion to sit still and then you brush it very lightly with this brush and the scorpion kind of relaxes and thinks, oh, that feels very nice and you can, you can get them to, um, to sit. Many, many scorpions did not want to sit and cooperate. Um, if scorpions are too cold, they don't want to cooperate. So, so people that were with me while I was photographing the scorpions and they were seeing the scorpion running around and they were getting frustrated and they were saying, no, just put the scorpion in the fridge. But if you put a scorpion in the fridge, it gets more tense. So um, they don't like being cold and then they really don't want to sit still. So, so hot scorpions are much easier to photograph than cold scorpions. Well-fed scorpions are much easier to photograph than hungry scorpions. Um, so it was, it was quite a job getting all of these photos. Um, it's quite a contraption having this bowl with all of these flashes, with all of these, um, uh, with a big camera as well. And I'd have to schlep this thing into the felt whenever I wanted to photograph scorpions. Um, so it, was, it, was, um, it was quite something, but, um, but I'm very happy with the way that the photos came out and, um, and, and, um, and how they're looking in the book. Um, this project also involved traveling to a huge number of places in the country. So this is just a map of, uh, that gives a sense of most of the places that I visited. Um, so you can see lots of areas here in Gauteng and up in Limpopo, but a huge amount of work over here on the western side of the country. That's because that's where most of the scorpion diversity actually is. And um, those are the places that you have to get to. So a huge amount of traveling involved, many, many field trips, um, but, but absolutely phenomenal to be able to do this, to be, to be able to go out and see all of these different places, many of which most people just never go and visit. So um, this photo is up on the top of the Rupir Sonder Entberg down in the Western Cape, um, where we had the, the, the sort of the, 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 the clouds coming over from the Southern Cape being stopped by the mountain range. Um, this was a campsite on a pan in the Northern Cape um, with, a, with, a, with a beautiful sunset, um, visiting dunes in the Kalahari. So this was, um, you, you have this kind of thorn felt with these big open sand dunes. This is the specific habitat of dune thick tail scorpions, which I'll tell you about in a sec. Um, I discovered a camel farm in the Northern Cape, um, visiting the Karoo. I mean, the Karoo is just absolutely amazing with its iconic um, uh, uh, windmills all over the place, just something, um, you know, wide open, beautiful spaces. Um, this is the Malopo River Canyon at Rimfas Mark. Um, so, I mean, it's just an amazing place to go and visit. Um, the campsite is just behind me in the photograph over here. Um, and then you walk down this path and there are hot springs down in this canyon. And um, so we visited this place on several uh, several field trips and it's, there's just nothing better when when you've been out UV lighting for scorpions at night 
and you come back afterwards and you can go and soak in the hot springs um, with, with these beautiful um, canyon walls around you and the stars above you. It's, it really is um, quite a special experience. Um, this is the top of Marupskop on the Mpumalanga Escarpment, also an absolutely unique place. Um, the views from there are absolutely astonishing. You look out from the top of Marupskop right across the low felt. You can see into Mozambique. And, um, and then the vegetation and topography up on the top is just completely astounding. It has a lot of Feinbos elements in it um, and, um, and some quite interesting scorpions up there as well. And obviously we saw lots of interesting things on these field trips as well. So I got to see quokerbooms in flower on one of the field trips. They have these incredible bright yellow flowers, something that I'd never seen before. Um, this is hoodia, um, which is like a, um, a cactus-like plant that occurs um, in the Kalahari and we got to see it flowering. Um, they, they actually produce, they, they, they attract flower, uh, uh, flies to their flowers. They're pollinated by flies. Um, not by bees, so the flowers are intended to look a little bit like um, like rotting flesh, and they they smell a bit funny as well. And um, and one of the absolute highlights was um, seeing half mints uh, in the Orange River Valley. So half mints being these um, these bizarre plants that occur up there. Um, they 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 curve northwards um, towards the sun, uh, very very prickly, with this little sort of cluster of, of um, of, of leaves on the top, an absolutely unique and very, very special plant to see. And we had to work quite hard to find them, but then we found this amazing colony of them with literally hundreds of individuals um, in that colony. And then obviously we see all kinds of other, other interesting things as well. So um, this is a trapdoor spider. Um, you know, my other interest is, is trapdoor and baboon spiders. And so we were managing to collect some interesting specimens of those along the way. Um, this is a little barking gecko over here. So you, you see all kinds of interesting reptiles and things while you're out at night, you know, especially while you're driving from one site to the next, um, seeing these little uh, geckos. Something that we found on this trip, we were out UV lighting and we found that these little web-footed geckos, which are, it's a dune specialist gecko that occurs in the northern part of the Ruthlisfeld and they occur through Namibia, through the Namib Desert as well. And we found that they glow under UV light, which was absolutely astonishing to see. I mean, I, I just didn't expect it. And if you look carefully, you can see that it's actually the gecko's skeleton that is glowing, um, glowing under UV light. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, I mean, this is just a, an amazing discovery. Um, you know, I should write this up as a paper. I mean, you know, who, you know, reptile people are not going out with UV lights looking for their reptiles. They're using torchlights. So, so um, that, you know, this is, this wasn't something that was known. And, um, and then a short while after I got back from that field trip, there was a publication in scientific reports about neon green fluorescence in this particular species of gecko. So somebody else beat me to it. And then there were some real highlights on this trip. So, so like I said, this book has got photos of the male and female of every single described scorpion species that we've got in the country, um, which is, which is um, that, that's never been done before. So this was the view from one of the spots where, um, where I was uh, waiting, for, uh, waiting for dark. It was a, it's, a, it's a particular scorpion locality. So I was hanging out on these dunes with this amazing view over the Namaqualand Hills, um, this this uh, storm system came over while I was um, while I was waiting there. Um, it didn't rain. We just I just it was actually a front. This big frontal system came over, um, but very very ex special experience just to be there in this wide open space and um, you know uh, all to myself essentially. And um, and then when I went UV lighting, I found this lady. So um, this is a particular species of burrowing scorpion. It's called Opsthalmus amapus. And um, as far as I know, these are the first color photographs that have ever been taken of a female of this species. Um, if, if not the first photographs taken, they are certainly the first photographs published. And um, when you go out looking for a lot of these uh, scorpion species, you go out at night and you find stacks of males all over the place because the males are out looking for the females. But the females are all sitting in their burrows and they see you coming. They see your UV light and zoop down the burrow they go. So um, I really had to work hard. It was multiple field trips um, to this area before I did actually manage to, um, to find the female. 
And this, this is another example. So this is a little um, pygmy burrowing scorpion. It's also, um, it's, it's, it's quite a small species, um, multiple trips to the site to try and find a female of this thing to get, the to get a photo. Um, on my last field trip, I was running out of time. Um, it was my last opportunity at this particular site. Um, and it was during the, the COVID lockdown. So, um, so I was, I, I'd parked my vehicle next to the road and I was walking up and down on these dunes. They live on sand dunes, walking up and down and up and down on these dunes, UV lighting, male, 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 not managing to find a female. And, um, and next thing I saw the cops pull up next to my, next to my vehicle. So I dashed back to the vehicle again um, to explain myself what I was there doing. Um, you know, they, they sort of said to me, you know, it's locked down. You're not supposed to be um, out and about doing things. And I said, well, I'm sleeping out in the felt here tonight. So, you know, so this is, this is my, this is where I need to be locked down. And, um, you know, they laughed and left and they were happy with the whole thing. And, um, and I switched on my UV light and turned around and on the other side of the road, there was this little female sitting there. And, um, and so I was over the moon about that, um, that one. And then this little scorpion here, this is the dune thick tail. It's, um, it, it's a remarkable little burrowing scorpion that lives on the Kalahari dunes. Um, it's down in the sort of southwestern part of the Kalahari. So Kalahari and those areas where you get these really large dunes. Um, the distinctive feature of this species is that they've got these really tiny little pointy pincers. Um, you know, like I don't know why they have such, the, the, the pincers are, are reduced in size. Um, and, and very straight and pointy. No idea why they've got these tiny little pincers, um, but, but it's, a, it's a very difficult scorpion to find. And I have not actually managed to find it myself yet. It's, um, it's, the on, it's now the only um, described South African scorpion species that I haven't actually ticked off my list. And so um, I'd been into the Kalahari multiple times, staying at Tuerifiran, staying near Tuerifiran, Uskam, those places looking for it. And um, Walter Jubber, who um, in this photo here, who manages the Kalahari Research Center near Fonsales Riss, um, had been messaging me and saying, listen, you know, like, do you think these scorpions will occur this far east? And I said to him, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think they're there. Um, I'd, I'd actually managed to get males. So, so on one of the trips into the Kalahari, there was another guy there um, who had collected a few males and I'd photographed the males and I was now searching, I needed to get a female. And, um, and Walter was saying to me, you know, do you think, do you think these things are here? I said to him, I don't think so, but keep a lookout for them. And, um, and one afternoon he sent me photos and he said, listen, we found these scorpions in our, um, in our pitfall traps here. Um, and I think they're, I think they're dune thick tails. And, um, and I was astonished, he, he had actually found them there, but the photos were all of males. So, um, so I said to him, okay, you know, great. So you've got the males, fantastic. Please look out for a female. I, you know, I'm desperate to get a female I, I, because if, if you can't get a female for me, the book is not gonna have a female. And, uh, and he said to me, hold on one second. And he, a few minutes later, he sent me a photo and he actually had a female in his traps as well. So off I went to um, Kalahari Research Center to go and uh, photograph this female scorpion. And um, I got her out, I got her set up, set up nicely on the gray card to take a photo. And, um, and as I pressed the shutter on my camera, my lens made this little buzzing sound and, and the camera didn't fire. And, um, and I couldn't get the camera to work. And it was, I mean, this was on one of the very last field trips for the book. I mean, it was just, you know, I was exasperated. Um, the lens, it's basically the little mechanism that operated the, the, the aperture on the lens had broken. And, um, and I messaged Walter and I said to him, listen, you know, my lens is just busted. Um, you know, I, I'm not, not going to be able to photograph a scorpion. And, uh, and he said to me, hang on, I've got, a, I've got a macro lens for a Canon. And so, um, so he saved the day there on multiple accounts. And, um, and so the book has... Um, as the male and female of that species. Um, and we also got uh, several new species along the way as well. So, so like I say, Southern, Southern Africa has got an incredible diversity of scorpions. Um, this is a new rock scorpion species on the left. I mean, astonishing that we've got scorpions this large that are still unknown to science. 
um, and this is a new burrowing scorpion from Namaquiland. Um, the book doesn't include these uh, undescribed species. Obviously, it only has the described species, and it takes much longer to get a scorpion species described than it does um, to, to write a book. So, um, yeah, so a great time was had by all. Lots of people involved on these uh, field trips. Um, these are, uh, this is Dimitri and Tucky, who I work with on um, some of the baboon spider stuff that I do as well. Um, Alistair with a nice big scorpion on one of our recent field trips. Um, but yeah, so, so I'm, I'm tremendously grateful to all of the help that I had on these trips. Um, and, and not just on trips. A lot of these guys were actually finding scorpions and sending them to me um, along the way as well. So back to the UV lighting, right? So like I said, this is one of, the, one of the nicest things about scorpions, the fact that they glow under UV light and, um, and anybody can, um, can, can add the scorpion UV lighting experience to their trips out into the bush, whether you're camping or hiking or four by fouring, I would really recommend getting your UV light and, um, and you can just in the evenings, take a quick walk around camp um, and see what's around. Um, around you. It's, it's always good fun. So, um, so Strake is actually running a competition um, with uh, the book at the moment. So you can win a copy of the book um, as well as a Scorpion UV light from um, African Snakebite Institute. I really recommend the UV lights from, um, from ASI. They're very high quality. Um, you can buy UV lights just, you know, sort of at various camping shops and things. Um, but, but these ones are really good. Um, you can also get yourself a pair of dark yellow protective goggles um, to wear when you go, you go UV lighting at night. It just helps to cut out all of this kind of purple glare that you get from the UV light and you can see the scorpions a little bit better. Um, but um, Belinda is going to post the, the link uh, into the chat for anyone who wants to, um, who wants to participate in that competition. And if you're doing that, so if you're going UV lighting for scorpions and um, taking photos of them, I would recommend posting them onto the citizen science platforms as well. So, so many of you might be involved with iNaturalist. Um, it's, it's great. You post the, the, you post the photo and the location, and those go into a database, which then helps scientists such, a, such as myself work out where the different scorpion species occur in the country, what their distributions are, what their ecology is, all of that kind of stuff. This is the coverage map in iNaturalist for scorpions at the moment. You can see lots of places that still need to be sampled. Obviously, we want this map to be as deep orange as possible with as much coverage as possible. Um, and if you're not using iNaturalist, um, hopefully you're using the ADU Virtual Museum, uh, which is our original homegrown uh, um, citizen science platform here in Southern Africa, and, um, and you can post your records there. This is the current coverage map that we have on the Virtual Museum for Scorpions, and you can st see also lots of areas that um, still need to be visited and, um, and filled in. So that brings me to the end of it. Um, I hope that's um, whetted your appetite for um, to, to learn a little bit more about scorpions and to uh, uh, to pay attention to them or, or go looking for them when you're out in the field. Um, uh, uh, there are a tremendous number of thank yous that are necessary um, for putting a book like this together. So um, I, the, my sponsors, the, the, the um, uh, Oppenheimer Generations, um, they very gener generously funded this. Mark and Christine Reed from the Everard Reed Art Gal Gallery and uh, Mapula Trust all very, very generously provided funding for this book. Obviously, Strake Nature, the whole team at Strake Nature, um, Rulin and Don, Dom and uh, Pippa, um, the number of emails that were going back and forth between uh, Rulin, the editor, and myself during the editing stages was, um, was tremendous. Um, but the book really, they've really done an amazing job. I think this book looks phenomenal and the credit is due to them um, for, for doing that. And, um, and, and then obviously all of the people that were helping out on field trips, as well as um, farmers who were allowing access to their land and, and all the rest of it. So a huge thank you to all of those. And that brings me to the end. Wow. Ian, that was 
Uh, fantastic. I mean, as the comments have been saying, what an absolutely amazing talk. Your passion and inspiration and knowledge and your willingness to share that with everybody is greatly, greatly appreciated and um, such a fascinating, fascinating topic. So I think we can get into some questions. If everybody has questions in the Q&A box, please feel free to, um, to add them into there and I'll start with what we've got uh, for now. Um, okay, Ian, so... Oh, personal question from Sandra. It says, are you related to Willi and Beth Engelbrecht? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no I'll ask, ask and answered. Um, yeah. And, and Penny has asked, does the male uh, mate only once in his life? No, so the males are able to multi mate, mul mate multiple times. Um, so they'll go out and um, with this, this little structure that they mate with, the little spermatophore, um, they, it does take them a while to form a new one. It obviously forms internally. Um, so it might take them several days or a week or two after they've mated before they'll be able to mate again. Um, but they will mate as many times as they can um, within, a, um, within the season. Um, some male scorpions are lucky. They do manage to live for more than one season. Um, you know, they might live for two or even three seasons. And, um, and yeah, mating as many times as they can. Cool. And then uh, another question from Sandra saying, during the two-week period on the mom's backs, are the babies visible with UV light? No, they're not. So they soft cuticles, they haven't hardened up yet. And so, um, and so they don't glow under UV light. Okay. And then uh, Raleen has got a question about antivenom. She said there's been some recent reports in the Daily Maverick indicating that there are some serious shortage of antivenom in South Africa. Yes. Would this apply only to reptiles or would this include antivenom uh, anti for our venomous scorpions? Yeah, we have a shortage of antivenom and electricity. Um, <laughs> so the um, I don't know what the situation is with scorpions. It's all manufactured by the same facility. Um, so I imagine that they're having the same problems. Um, African Snake Bite Institute is um, your first stopping point if you want to find out what's going on with antivenom. Um, you know, they are, I'm not, not sure of the details, they, they, but they are um, looking into setting, setting up antivenom distribution points and, um, and you know, basically tackling um, all of the, um, all of the antivenom related stuff. Great. Um, and then Alison has asked, she said, we once met a Belgian heart specialist in the Kalahari who was a scorpion researcher and was interested in the uses of venom in medical procedures. What does it, uh, what does it have? Book looks great. Uh, what do, oh, what uses does it have? Do, uh, is, do you know if there are any uses for the venoms? Um, yeah, so, so people are doing research on all kinds of, you know, snake venom, scorpion venom, spider venoms for all sorts of purposes. And, um, and so, um, you know, so they look at the individual proteins and what kind of actions they have. Um, I think there was a stage where they were looking at using um, scorpion venom compounds as a possible alternative, non-addictive alternative to morphine. Um, one of the really interesting use cases, actually, I don't think it's actually, it's being used yet, but it's, it's kind of um, being researched in, in development is that um, uh, some of the scorpion venom compounds are able to cross uh, across the blood brain barrier. So they're actually able to get into your central nervous system. And, uh, you know, not, not a lot of compounds can do that. Mm. So, so um, what doctors are looking at doing is using, using these scorpion venoms as transporters for other compounds, um, specifically to transport dyes to um, for for brain tumors. So basically, so when you do uh, when you do brain surgery, one of the problems is knowing what's uh, a brain tumor and, and what's um, brain tissue. And so mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to attach a, attach a little compound that will attach to the tumor and attach another compound that ironically gr glows under ultraviolet ultraviolet light. And the scorpion venom carries it into the brain and it actually coats the the tumor and then they're able to see. Um, what's tumor wow. tissue and what's healthy tissue so yeah so so some pretty phenomenal stuff wow um uh penny's asking that book it's, it's, is it southern africa or only south africa do you think it could it's, be used in southern yeah. africa <laughs> i had to finish the book so it's only south africa so okay. um 
So, so the book covers um, basically everything that you will find in South Africa, mo uh, most of Botswana, most of Zimbabwe, um, and most of southern Mozambique, right? Obviously, Lesotho and Swaziland as well. Um, there are a few species in, um, in Zimbabwe and Mozambique which are not included um, in the book. So, so technically, it's just South Africa. Um, but it will help you a lot in the other in the other southern African countries as well. Yeah, great. Um, Margaret has asked if their site is so bad, how do they hunt for their prey? So yeah, so I forgot to mention that. So they're, they're, scorpions get around by touch. Basically, they're very very touch sensitive. So they've got all kinds of sensors all, all over their body that are sensitive to touch and to vibration. Um, the main ones are the hairs that they've got all over their body. So if you look at a scorpion, it's very, very hairy. Um, a lot of those hairs are sensitive to direct contact, just like our hairs are. If you touch your hair, you know you're touching something. But they've also got these little special sensory hairs in amongst those called trichobothria. They're very, very thin and they sit in a little specialized pit. And those actually pick up air vibrations. So it's quite amazing if you, if you look mm. very carefully at a scorpion with the light glistening on the hairs, um, most of the hairs are still, and then you see these little trichobothria like moving back and forth as they, um, as the, as air currents pass over them. And, um, and they've, so they've got them all over their pincers. They're scattered all over their pincers. They're basically like all of these little sensory points. And if there's something, a little insect wiggling about in the distance over there, the hairs on this pincer move first and then on this pincer, and they're able to pinpoint, okay, cool, there's something over there. And they're so sensitive that scorpions can actually catch insects that out of the air as they fly past, you know, so a moth goes past and the scorpion just grabs it, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so that's how they, they've also got little sensors in their feet and they've got little chemical sensors on their pincers and their mouth parts and um, all over the place. Sure. Um, and then Margaret, another question for you, I'm assuming this is correct, that the, the uh, anti-venom is specific for scorpions. That's not like you use a snake venom or a, no. or a spider venom, it's specific. It's specific, yes. Great. Um, Callum has asked, uh, have there ever been any hybrids between scorpions, like rock scarp scorpions mixed with the burrowing? Do they cross species, do they hybridize? It's yeah, so definitely not at that level. So um, I am not aware of any scorpion hybrids. Um, I think if you did take some closely related species and put them together in captivity, you might get hybrids, um, but certainly not something, you know, so, so that's like if you took two very closely related burrowing scorpion species, mm -hmm. um, you might be able to get them to hybridize. Might. I don't know of any cases where it's happened. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Um, Mara Ping is asking, as he, I think he missed, I think you did say it was the general lifespan of a scorpion. You said anywhere from six months to, to number of years. years. Yes. Yeah. Several years. So, so it's really, really species dependent. Yes. Uh, Peter Fulion has asked, do any of these, um, scorpions squirt their venom? Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so for a long time, there was this fallacy that some of the thick tail scorpions squirt their venom the same way that spitting cobras spit their venom. That, so, so, and the story was they can spray their venom up to a meter and they're trying to get it in your eyes and um, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see that all, all, all the scorpion books say that. Um, and in all the time that I've been catching scorpions and, and I catch thick tail scorpions with forceps, you, you, know, you don't use your hands, obviously. Um, and you, you know, you grab them with a forceps. Um, the, the, the most that I've seen is that they can spray their venom about sort of 10, maybe 15 centimeters. And, um, and it's more like a little, a little bit of excitement. You, you know, you grab the scorpion, it gets a fright and like some venom squirts out. Um, there is, there was a paper written, which suggested that, um, that this is actually a defense against rodent predators or, or very small vertebrate predators, rodents and birds and things like that. That if they're biting the scorpion and it sprays the venom, it might get into the um, into the rodent's eyes, and 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 it, it's extremely painful if it does get into your eyes. It's agonizing, mm -hmm. agonizingly painful. But it's not something that that humans need to worry about. They're just you know they're not able to spray at a distance that affects us. Right. Uh, Margaret has asked, do the thick-tailed um, release their prey after stinging it, then wait for the venom to have an effect before eating the food? No, they don't. They grab it and they sting it. It dies very, very quickly, and then they 
They often they often just stuff it in. If if they catch a small prey item, they won't even bother stinging it. They just stuff it into their mouth alive and start eating it. Okay. And then Mel has got a, a, a longish question here. In and how at the foot of the Falkenberg, I don't have to go out searching for scorpions. Bitten once in the dark in the middle of the night in my bathroom, nearly stood on one again the next night next to my bed, and then was bitten on my finger at the bottom of the garden. Yeah. How do you know where to find them? How do you know? What do, how do you catch them and what do you do when you finished photographing them? <laughs> yeah, so um, so so people are typically astonished when when they actually find out how common scorpions are. So you don't see them a lot, right? You know, like like you you kind of got to go looking for them. I remember in the uh, uh, on a trip to the Kruger Park when I was a student with with some friends. Um, I said, you know, let's we were in one of the camps and I said, let's go looking for scorpions. And they were like, oh, we're not going to see any scorpions. And uh, we walked up to the first tree with our, you know, with the UV light, and there were eight scorpions on the first tree, you know. Um, I think the Strake team were also quite surprised. I took them out on Lion's Head, and I think they were also like, oh, God, he's dragging us up Lion's Head, and we're not going to see anything. And the, the path was just full of scorpions. Wow. So, um, so there are a lot of them around. And... Um, and, and UV light is your number one way of finding them. So, so um, you know, someone, if you, if, if you have them in your garden, you could check out at night and see, catch them in your garden and relocate them back up onto the mountain. Um, but for a lot of them, you, a lot of the species are quite specialized and you do have to know exactly where to go to find them, um, you know, when to be there, what kind of conditions, what kind of habitat, all of that kind of stuff. Mm. And all of that stuff's covered in the book. So it's, it's um, yeah. Good. Uh, Gerda has asked which, uh, which are the common species that occur along the coast, for example, in the Kuchelberg or the Cape Peninsula? So, um, yeah, so the most common species that you're going to see down there is a little thing called the striped lesser thick tail scorpion. It's a little brown scorpion like that, pale stripe down the middle of the back. And, um, and they're all over the place, you know, so and that's probably what's what's coming into people's gardens. Mm. Um, you also see um, a lot of, um, so, so the Cape Peninsula has got Cape burrowing scorpions on it. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about the Cape Peninsula is that there are no thick tail scorpions, no parabuthus get across the Cape Flats and onto the actual peninsula. So, mm -hmm. so they're around Durbanville, you get parabuthus granulatus, which is our most potently venomous scorpion, is, is around Durbanville, but it doesn't cross the Cape Flats. It's, it's quite strange. Um, and then obviously there are um, cape creeping scorpions if you go a little bit further uh, east as well, very common. Perfect. Uh, Charles has asked, is it true that scorpions don't like coming out in the bright moonlight? Yes, so that is definitely true. So um, again, it's because they, they're trying to avoid predators. So if you've got a nice big, I mean, you, you know, on, on a nice bright moonlit night, you can walk around without a torch, you can see where you're going. And, um, and so if scorpions were out and active, they would be very visible to owls. So, so owls are a big scorpion predators. Um, and there are bats as well that like to pick up scorpions. Bats are obviously not hunting by eyesight, but, um, um, but yeah, so they're basically, so the best time to look for scorpions is, is dark nights. Um, when it's warm, it needs to be warm. And, um, and, and preferably it needs to be dry, but there should have been some rain within the last couple of weeks. Um, just to kind of get the activity going, and then you see them. Uh, Clinton is asked: Is it possible that the females can detect the fitness level of the males from the males' little dance? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know if anyone's looked at that specifically. Um, whether whether females refuse males based on how they dance. I think that's um, okay. <laughs> that's the question. Um, what we do see is that you get a, a behavior called mate guarding in scorpions, where um, a, a, a male will actually find a female that's not ready, that, that's not quite ready to, to mate, and he moves in with her in her retreat. So it'll be a female that's either about to give, give birth um, or a subadult female that's about to shed her skin and, and mature. And, um, and he moves in with her and he basically fends off other males. And then if a bigger, stronger male comes in, he pushes that male out. And then you get the biggest, strongest male mating with the female when she's ready. Uh, Eleanor um, has said, I read a book by Eugene Marais with a vivid description of a scorpion targeting a chicken. <laughs> Have you ever seen a scorpion deliberately charge, uh, target a larger animal that was not interfering with it? 
Um, yeah, it's so, so, so the answer to that question is no, I haven't seen it. So um, scorpions are, they're, they're not out trying to get you. Their, their main thing is to get away and hide away as quickly as possible. So when you disturb them, the, the kinds of aggressive behaviors that we see in scorpions, you know, you disturb them, you upset them, they stand up, some of them hiss, you know, so some of them are rubbing their mouth parts together to hiss. The, the thick tail scorpions scrape their sting over the first tail segments to make like a hissing sound. And it's all just show trying to scare you off and trying to give the scorpion a chance to um, to get away and actually um, and, 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 you know, find find somewhere to hide just to get away from you, basically. Uh, Ashley has said, no are chain. there, oh, you're load shedding, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Ashley says, are there plans to turn the field guide into an app in the future? Um, so the field guide has just come out. So um, I think they, they, we haven't talked about any plans for anything else yet. Um, it's, it's, I think we're going to see how it goes with the field guide and, and, and I'm sure Strake will, um, will discuss with me what their plans are next. Um, and Christine says, we saw, small, we saw small scorpions on the mountain near Frulicate in McGregor uh, on a day hike. Is this common? On a day hike? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, so people do very occasionally see scorpions out during the day. Um, there's a species, a, a big species of thick tail scorpion along the Orange River Valley and further north into Namibia that is actually um, diurnal. It, it comes out during the day and it walks, uh, you know, it does its thing during the day. Um, but typically when people see scorpions during the day, it's either because the scorpion has been disturbed in its retreat, perhaps like a nest of ants has emerged in its burrow or something like that. And it's had to, um, it's had to come out and find somewhere else to, to hide. Um, or when there is um, a, 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 um, abundant prey around. So, so some people have observed, observed when you get these like day flying uh, termites coming out of a nest and there are lots of termites running around on the ground, the scorpions will actually come out and grab mm. the termites as well. Yeah. Okay. And then Mauro Penn's got a two part question here. He said there's a, a huge chunk of the middle of South Africa. He's referring to those, those maps where, where, where it seems to be little collected or seen scorpions. Is this because there are there aren't many to find there or that people aren't searching in those areas? And then second part is, are the scorpions a good indicator of climate change? Mm. Um, yeah, so those maps that I showed are pretty much, a, you know, that's that's a map of sampling efforts. That's where people are going looking for scorpions. Um, typically, you know, when people go looking for scorpions, they want to go to nice, interesting areas, mountain, mountainous areas, and um, that kind of thing. They're not thinking about the, the middle flat free state. Um, and because of that, what, what I found is that we've actually missed some pretty interesting stuff, you know, so the Mpumalanga High Felt, for example, has got interesting scorpions, but nobody looks for scorpions on the Mpumalanga High Felt. Um, so basically, you know, we, we do want to get as much coverage of those areas as possible with our surveying and all the rest. Um, nobody's looked at um, the impact of climate change on scorpions. Um, and um, I think that I think some species may be affected, you know, some of the we do have sort of some mountain top specialist scorpions, which are probably adapted to the cooler conditions up on the top of the mountains and climate change may well affect those negatively. Um, but yeah, but uh, you know, we, we, we won't see the same kind of rain shifts in scorpions as what people see in things like butterflies. So, mm. so people are tracking butterfly range changes in Europe in relation to climate change, for example. Um, scorpions, most scorpions are, are quite specific to a particular kind of substrate or geology or vegetation type or something like that. And so that's determining where they occur rather than what the climate conditions are. Got you. Well, Ian, that was uh, fantastic. I think you have asked, answered everybody's questions. You've filled us all with knowledge and, and, and um, your passion, it, it comes through. So it just leaves me to thank you once again for, for sharing with us and to remind everybody that our next talk will be on Wednesday, the 7th of June at 10.30 but you'll all get your, your reminders closer to the time. And uh, once again, thank you, Ian. Thank you to Belinda and everybody behind the scenes and wishing you all a pleasant rest of the week. Thank you so yes, much. Thank you. Thank you bye all bye so bye. much.
Bye-bye.